So, Marvel was way ahead of DC in the late 60s so far as black representation in their comics was concerned. And that was not only true with heroes, it was also true with supporting characters. For example, in September 1966, in the pages of The Avengers, Henry Pym, who had previously been known as Ant-Man, but had now sort of reversed his uh, his growth thing and become Giant Man. Actually, he became he went from Ant Man to Giant Man to Goliath. Anyway, um, in one storyline where he accidentally got stuck uh, as uh, as as a giant, Tony Stark, alias Iron Man, sent one of his top scientists over to help him, named Bill Foster, and they worked so well together that uh, Foster wound up being the permanent lab partner of Dr. Henry Pym. Now, the storyline um, didn't, didn't call necessarily for uh, a black character. He was, not, um, he was not a sidekick. He was, well, I guess maybe in a way he was. A, he was kind of like an assistant. But um, he was an eminent highly qualified scientist and one of the top in his field. Uh, and he appeared off and on over the following years. Um, and about, uh, well, almost a decade later, nine years later, 1975, in the pages of actually uh, Luke Cage's comic, Bill Foster um, followed in the footsteps of Henry Pym and started using the uh, uh, the PIM particles, the, the, the growth thing, uh, and he became uh, a superhero called Black Goliath and uh, got his own book in 1976, although it only lasted for a few issues. Now, the character of Bill Foster who had first shown up in 1966, was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck, the artist. It was Tony Isabella and artist George Tuska who made the transition uh, to have Bill Foster become actually another black exploitation superhero. Uh, if George Tuska's name sounds familiar, he was, he was the guy that had drawn the first issue of Luke Cage Hero for Hire. And like I said, uh, it was that, that comic where Black Goliath first showed up. So Tony Isabella was, was the scripter for Black Goliath by that time. Well, um, over the ensuing years after the cancellation of his own book, uh, Bill Foster went from being Black Goliath to calling himself Giant Man. Um, and then back to Black Goliath, and then back to Giant Man. So I guess he, he followed in Henry Pym's footsteps in more ways than one, because, well, I'm not even going to get into all the, uh, all the identities of Henry Pym right here. We'll do that later. Anyway, if you saw the movie Ant-Man and the Wasp, which was the second Ant-Man movie, then you've seen this character. You've seen Bill Foster. He just uh, uh, wasn't uh, in costume as a superhero. You, you met him as the former partner of Henry Pym, who was played by, by Kirk Douglas and Bill Foster was played by Lawrence Fishburne. He did mention, though, that uh, he had himself grown to a height of 12 feet. So uh, maybe he was Black Goliath at one time, or maybe he yet will be. So anyway, Bill Foster... Very important supporting character who went on to become a superhero in his own right. Introduced in Marvel in the late 60s. The following year, uh, another character was introduced. And I've kind of mentioned him because when Stan Lee was on that radio interview and they asked, you know, about black characters, he mentioned Joe Robertson. Uh, Joe Robertson first showed up in Amazing Spider-Man number 51. Um, and became one of the most important members of Spider-Man's supporting cast uh, 
for years thereafter, and so far as I know, still is. Um, he was uh, he was the city editor of the Daily Bugle, the newspaper where Spider-Man, uh, as his secret identity, Peter Parker, worked as a photographer. Right, so you you're probably familiar uh, through movies or, or cartoons if you haven't read comics with Peter Parker's mean boss, J. Jonah Jameson, who at this time was the editor of the newspaper. Joe Robertson was the city editor, so he was like the number two guy. Later on, Jameson became the publisher, and Robertson became the editor. Now, again, uh, the script uh, did not, and the plot did not specifically call for this character to be black. He was a newspaper man who just happened to be African American. And over the, uh, over the following years, he was uh, sort of portrayed as a sympathetic mentor character to, to Peter Parker. And not long after the character was introduced, a couple of years, actually about a year and a half, there was a really significant storyline in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man. And by this time, we had met not only Joe Robertson, who is usually known to his friends as Robbie, but... Uh, his whole family, his his wife uh, Martha and his son Randy, who was also a college student uh, with Peter Parker at Empire State University, and the storyline revolves around student protest. Now, what they were protesting was the fact that uh, some of the, one of the older uh, buildings on campus was going to be leased out to this private company uh, as sort of like a hotel for the university to make some extra money. And the students were upset because they felt like this building should be, if it was no longer being used, should be made into a lower cost dorm for the students. And so that's how the protest started. But it became also a, uh, a protest uh, for black power, civil rights. And uh, Robbie's son winds up getting arrested, and Robbie comes to, to bail him out, and there's this ongoing argument between the two of them as to what is the right approach, right? So the son is very angry, and he is out there raising a ruckus, he and his, uh, his friends, and his dad, who is obviously, uh, well, he's obviously older, he's his dad, who's uh, kind of a part of the middle class uh, establishment because, you know, he has, he has a really good job. Uh, and he is of an older generation that, that believes that, you know, you should be more restrained in your, in your protests. And it's significant that this was even being addressed in a comic book. It was written by Stan Lee, uh, drawn by John Romita. It was... Uh, um, really, I mean, really significant that this topic's being addressed. But what makes it more significant and makes it different from the way these issues uh, were portrayed? Remember, remember Gabe Jones there in the Sergeant Fury story uh, when uh, he essentially talked this black lady into saying she didn't want to be a Negro anymore. She was just an American because everyone's colorblind. Um, that's not how this plays out. Uh, the way it plays out is that both sides are represented equally and fairly. You know, the younger generation and their anger and their desire for direct action and the older generation and their restraint and their reliance on the law. Uh, both sides are equally represented. And even more significant than that is that Robbie the dad almost kind of comes around to his son's way of thinking, uh, at least goes so far as to say maybe, maybe the younger generation is right. Maybe there's been enough talk, and maybe it is time to actually do something. Now, that sort of thing is, is, is unheard of really in mainstream media in general at that time. Um, 
and in a comic book. So that's this this is a story that a storyline which went on for several issues that I think should get more attention from scholars. All right. Well, I told you the situation there in Gotham City when I checked it out there in 1968 and 69. Um, no black people at all, except for the one basketball player. And throughout the 1960s, that's kind of how it was at DC. There were a couple of black characters uh, introduced uh, in a couple of titles, but for the most part, it's hard to even find black people in a crowd scene. There's only, I think, a couple of examples in all of DC Comics in all of the 1960s. But I hinted before when we talked about that, that that did change in the Batman comics in 1970 when Denny O'Neill, the writer, and Neil Adams, the artist, took over that title. Now, they also took over Green Lantern. And actually, uh, they changed the title from Green Lantern to Green Lantern and Green Arrow. So they had the two of them become partners. And this was the case while they were on that book for two or three years. And early on in their run, in 1970, one of the most famous exchanges about race in comic book history played out in the pages of DC Comics. So, essentially, just to set this up, what had happened is that Green Lantern, and by the way, uh, Green Lantern and Green Arrow, they're like best friends and partners, but they're political opposites. Green Arrow is extremely liberal, and Green Lantern is conservative. Well, uh, Green Lantern is, is flying along, and he sees an angry crowd beating up a guy in a suit. So... Uh, he gets really upset and, and comes down and, and beats them up and gives them a lecture about law and order because the, the guy was their landlord. And then Green Arrow shows up and, and says, you know, you don't even know what's going on. Uh, you don't even know that he's evicting all these people uh, unfairly and they're upset and they have a right to be upset. Um, and then this elderly black man who lives in the building comes out and has this exchange with Green Lantern. And you know, in a way, this could be this could be an exchange between Black America and superheroes in general, superheroes in general, all the way up to 1970. So the black guys like, I've been reading about how you work for the Blueskins, uh, that's the the people in Oa that gave him his powers. And how on a planet someplace you helped out the orange skins and you done considerable for the purple skins, all aliens. Only their skins you never bothered with, the black skins. And I want to know, how come? Answer me that, Mr. Green Lantern. And he says, uh, in you know a, a posture that denotes that uh, he has a moment of shame here. I can't. And then that leads to a dialogue, um, ongoing dialogue between the two <coughs> superheroes. Well, a um, couple of years later, in that same title, Green Lantern, uh, Green Arrow, another black character is introduced. Really, I guess you could say, I'm, I'm pretty sure you could say, this was DC's first African-American superhero, John Stewart. Now, the Green Lantern, Silver Age Green Lantern's name was Hal Jordan. And uh, he was, remember when we had that discussion about the Lensman way, way back and how they influenced so many different things? So the Green Lantern Corps, there's like a representative in every sector of space, and they're kind of like this space police force. And... Um, Hal Jordan needs, he needs a, uh, a backup. He needs uh, a substitute in case something happens to him uh, or in case something comes up and he can't handle it because he's doing something else. And so his, uh, his, his bosses, essentially, the blue guys on the planet Oa, <clears throat> single out the person that they want him to train as his replacement 
and it is this black guy who is uh, he's an architect uh, but uh, he is uh, when when Green Lantern and Green Arrow first encounter him he's in an altercation with a policeman because the cop was being very abrasive and abusive uh, I think to another black person and John Stewart steps up and is giving him a piece of his mind and Green Lantern is like well, I don't want this guy I don't want this guy to, to, to replace me and his bosses are like yeah well it's not your choice um, and so he does he does become the substitute uh, sort of like the auxiliary Green Lantern and he's presented as kind of a um, black power um, black exploitation type hero uh, in the fact that he is this almost this this radical sort of uh, very angry person calling for action direct action and uh, again that that opens up opportunities for conversation Now, once Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams leave the book, which is just a few issues after this, um, John Stewart as Green Lantern didn't get used very much. Their, their intention was to make him a regular part of the, uh, the supporting cast, but he kind of gets shuffled in the background, only shows up a handful of times all through the, 19, the rest of the 1970s and the first half of the 1980s. And there's a story, by the way, about... Um, about the fact that with these African-American characters that O'Neill and Adams introduced, that DC's uh, editors were, were reluctant. They didn't want to, to seem like they were being controversial. They didn't want to seem political. And according to Neil Adams, the artist, he took the editor to the window uh, of the office there in New York City and said, just look out at the people walking around. What do you see? You see lots of different kinds of people. They're not all white people. Anyway, uh, John Stewart uh, would start getting used more in the mid '80s. He would uh, briefly have his own. Uh, he had a mini series, uh, and in the late '90s, when uh, they were making started making animated uh, uh, an animated series about the Justice League, and DC had a serious shortage of black characters and they needed some diversity so uh, uh, he got uh, elevated to, to be the official Green Lantern on the cartoon and therefore uh, a whole generation of kids who grew up watching that um, think of him primarily when they think of of Green Lantern but it took a long time to get there so 1972 DC gets their first black superhero John Stewart Green Lantern uh, although he is only an occasional guest star in 1976 they introduced an African American character to the uh, Legion of Superheroes remember those are the guys in the 30th century named Tyrock who was uh, not the best character and didn't have the best costume by a long shot uh, who was focused on uh, it was the focus of one story, and after that, uh, only appeared in the background in group shots. So, uh, Tyrock, that's 1976. By 1976, Marvel had the Black Panther, the Falcon, Luke Cage, Blade the Vampire Hunter, Black Goliath, Storm and Misty Knight, both of which we're going to... Uh, going to look at uh, in a bit brother voodoo uh, that is only a partial list so clearly uh, DC has some catching up to do and uh, they finally decided uh, DC um, leadership decided that it was it was time to have a black character headline their own DC comic book and in part it's um it was a matter of wanting to cash in on the black uh, black exploitation uh, popularity, which is uh, kind of kind of a signal of, of where DC was so far as being up on the culture because by 1977 
black exploitation movies were pretty well out of the picture. But they had uh, they had the desire to have a black superhero. They even had one designed and had the scripts written for uh, a couple of the first issues and they were going to call it the black bomber and they reached out to tony isabella remember he's the guy we just talked about that wrote for luke cage and uh turned bill foster into black goliath uh they they got him over to dc comics uh because he had he had experience writing black characters even though he was uh he was not African American. Well, they brought him over and told him all about the Black Bomber. So here's their plan. Um, the Black Bomber was a white guy who was a Vietnam veteran. And while in Vietnam, he had been exposed to this Agent Orange like stuff that was supposed to help soldiers to camouflage and blend in to the jungle. And the side effect of him being exposed to that is whenever he gets really angry or really upset, presto, he turns into a big, scary black guy uh, in, a, in a basketball suit. So that was their plan. Uh, Tony Isabella uh, came in, listened to their plan and their uh, uh, description for the character and said, that's a horrible plan. He said, do you really want your first black superhero to be a white racist guy? Because that was another thing. The guy is a racist and he hates black people, but he turns into one and then forgets that he had. So uh, uh, Isabella was like, yeah, this, this is just stupid. Uh, this is crazy. And, and he said, I have a character that I have already designed um, that I think we should go with instead called Black Lightning. And uh, Black Lightning, he's got electrical powers in his uh, secret identity. He's a school teacher, former track star, um, and he works in the uh, in the inner city and is a good role model for for African American kids, both in costume and out. So he said, "Let's use this character, and I'll just rewrite, but just toss out those other those other stuff, and we'll just do this." And so they agreed. And African-American artist Trevor Von Eden, who was just around 19 at the time, was assigned uh, to, uh, to, to be the artist. And the first issue of Black Lightning came out in April 1977. Again, the timing was terrible, uh, in part because the black exploitation thing was sort of already passe, but also... Uh, we're going to talk about this later when we get back into the historical narrative. 1978 was a horribly disastrous year for DC Comics, and they wound up canceling almost all the new books they had started in the previous couple of years. And uh, that happened to Black Lightning. He got canceled pretty quick. But uh, then uh, he guest starred a lot. Uh, he became a member of Batman's group, The Outsiders, got his own title again, and... Uh, in a more contemporary setting, uh, as of as of this recording in the summer of 2020, there have been three seasons of the Black Lightning television show. In fact, uh, in the uh, in, in the third season, there was a cameo from um, there. You can see Trevor Von Eden and Tony Isabella playing judges. So so that was kind of that was kind of cool. But Black Lightning. DC's first major superhero to headline their own title. And only, well, you could say their third black superhero overall. But uh, uh, the first two were supporting characters. Okay, I mentioned that by 1976 you had Storm. And I've talked about Storm before when we were talking about uh, women in comics. Uh, I'll go into detail about how this happened again when we get to the narrative, but in 1975 a whole new group of X-Men was introduced, one of them being Storm, who was um, 
African and African American, I guess you could say, because her father, her father was African American and her mother was from Kenya. And she herself had been born in Kenya and had spent her childhood either in Kenya, a part of it in Egypt. Uh, so uh, she was a, a strong female character, uh, probably the first strong female African American superhero character. I also mentioned Misty Knight, who was one half of the duo, the Daughters of the Dragon, the other half being Colleen Wing. Colleen Wing, let me see if I can remember. I always have trouble keeping this straight. Colleen Wing's mother was Japanese, and her father was half white and half Chinese. So that made her one half Japanese, one quarter Chinese, one quarter Caucasian. Anyway, uh, yeah, so she was a martial arts person, Colleen Wing, whose specialty was the katana or samurai sword. Misty Knight was a tough, no-nonsense former police detective who had, uh, who, whose police detective career was cut short when uh, she lost, uh, lost her arm in a bombing incident when she was trying to uh, apprehend some uh, some bad guys and uh, Tony Stark had uh, stepped in having heard about her sacrifice and designed a prosthetic arm for her that uh, it was a bionic arm so she was super strong with with that arm anyway uh, the two of them had a private detective agency kind of like hero for hire that Luke Cage had private detectives or security uh, called Nightwing Restorations and they made up the Daughters of the Dragon. I say first appearance 1974 slash 75. That's because each of them was introduced in the pages of Iron Fist who was another martial arts character and they were both supporting characters in Iron Fist at first and uh, Colleen Wing appeared there first in 74, Misty Knight appeared in 75. So on the right is the cover of uh, uh, the miniseries uh, that they headlined in the 21st century. On the left is the splash page of uh, one of one of the issues of the black and white magazine, uh, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, in which they had a, a, a feature. They were one of the uh, one of the features. Also, um, more recently, both characters appeared on the Netflix Marvel Defenders series, uh, plural, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, The Defenders, um, and, and so forth, which I was kind of hoping that uh, they would get their own show, but then Marvel and Netflix kind of severed their deal and all those shows got canceled. Well, Misty Knight uh, and Iron Fist, that's him on the left, had a romantic relationship, an interracial romantic relationship that was ongoing, which was a first for superhero comics. And they even shared this is their first on-panel kiss from 1977, um, which is one of the first interracial kisses ever shown. Um, again, I can't really speak to what may have happened in underground comics and independent comics, which uh, there were a lot of those. Um, but so far as major companies, this is one of one of the first such instances, 1977. But it wasn't. It was the first. It was the first interracial kiss shared by superheroes. We can say that for sure. But there was one previous portrayal of an interracial kiss in Marvel Comics two years before that, in the pages of Amazing Adventures, whose uh, headline uh, character during that period was Kill Raven warrior of the worlds which was kind of a, uh, a dystopian future science fiction title 
um, that was uh, written by Don McGregor. So in that one, a couple of the supporting characters had a, a brief romantic interlude. So that would qualify as the first interracial comics kiss, unless you counted the black and white magazines as comic books, which, which I do, because essentially they were. Um, and in that case, you can go back earlier to 1972 to an issue of Creepy, which was put out by Warren Publications, one of those black and white horror magazines I've mentioned several times that Warren put out. Uh, this one was uh, from a story about a, uh, a black private detective who was looking for a werewolf. And uh, it was written by Don McGregor. All right, well, I mentioned Iron Fist a couple of times. He's not African American, but uh, uh, he's clearly closely involved with a lot of the African American characters, with Misty Knight as his girlfriend, and eventually with Luke Cage as his partner. Now, Luke Cage had started off in the comic book Luke Cage, Heroes for Hire. But in issue, I think, 17, they changed the name from Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, to Luke Cage, Power Man, because they decided he needed a superhero name because people were, were, weren't buying the book because they didn't realize it was a superhero book because there was no superhero name. So they called him Power Man. Then in the late 70s, I think this was 1978, as both black exploitation movies and kung fu movies had seriously declined in popularity, that was a, that was a fad that had passed and the comic book Power Man and the comic book Iron Fist and a lot of the other martial arts comic books were losing readers and were on the verge of cancellation and what Marvel decided to, to, to do instead of canceling both of those books was to combine them into one book and have the guys team up and become partners so Luke Cage and uh, Iron Fist also, uh, just like Daughters of the Dragon, Heroes for Hire. It became it went from Hero for Hire to the company was called Heroes for Hire. And uh, off and on, that partnership has continued ever since. Uh, here's a more recent uh, version of that. So uh, Luke Cage went from Luke Cage to Power Man, back to Luke Cage. Uh, Power Man was, uh, uh, lasted for about 20 years. All right, well, perhaps you were wondering, uh, this is a little off the topic of black superheroes, but we're bringing in all this Kung Fu stuff, and we've got an Asian character in Colleen Wing. Why is Iron Fist a white guy? Well, the same reason the Phantom, protector of Africa, was a white guy. It's kind of like the white savior syndrome. And it's kind of like Amazing Man from way back in 1939, created by Bill Everett. Um, who created Iron Fist? Why, uh, the artist, I think, was Gil Kane, but the writer was Roy Thomas. Remember the guy who was obsessed, really, with Golden Age comics and pulp heroes? Uh, he loved Amazing Man. And so the origin of Iron Fist was basically exactly the same as Amazing Man, which was in the public domain by that time. In fact, he dedicated the first issue of Iron Fist, the first appearance, to Bill Everett, an amazing man. So that's how you wind up with, uh, with this uh, uh, white guy in the, uh, in the Kung Fu stories, and then mixed in with Luke Cage and Misty Knight. A lot of other African-American characters followed, and I'm not even going to try, I'm not even going to attempt to list them from Marvel, DC, and other companies. Just suffice it to say that by the 1980s, it had become fairly common to now have new African-American characters, even as headliners of their own books. I do want to look at uh, one character in particular that seemed a lot like a step in the wrong direction that came out in 1990 
in the pages of The Avengers, issue 328 of The Avengers. A black hero named Rage. And, and here's his backstory. He's kind of like Billy Batson in Captain Marvel. He's actually like a 14-year-old kid uh, who is able to transform into this big, muscular, scary-looking black guy, but still has the mind of the 14-year-old kid. And so he's dressed all in leather with a ski mask. All right, so big, scary, angry black guy. Rage, like, you know, roid rage. It's the side effect of the uh, the drug that transforms him. So big, angry, uh, scary black guy in a ski mask. How could that go wrong? Well, um, plus the fact that he is a, a juvenile, a minor, who appears much larger and more dangerous than he actually is. Uh, so that just ties into a lot of stuff that is still going on. And previously, you know, when I would talk about this character, I would just uh, shake my head and say, oh my gosh, can't believe that uh, Larry Hama, whom we'll talk about later, would... Uh, would have created a character like this. But in recent years, I feel like the character has been redeemed somewhat. And a storyline that he appeared in, in the pages of Sam Wilson, Captain America. So this is like after the Falcon has taken over as Captain America. And the storyline involved these private security uh, forces that had been basically uh, uh, New York had outsourced their police department. So these were private security people doing police actions and they were going into black neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods and just abusing people. And so uh, the Falcon, of course, is, is opposed to that, but he is taking the more traditional approach, the law and order approach, rage, is enraged over it, and he sort of stirs up, uh, um, well, I wouldn't say stirs up, he, he inspires. He inspires a group of, a large group of people living in the neighborhood to rise up and resist the police brutality. And uh, he and the Falcon are at odds over what is the right way to resist oppression and what is the right way to protest. And the Falcon sort of, against his will, gets drawn into it because the cops show up and they just start beating up him too, right? And so then he has to fight as well. And uh, in the story, Rage winds up being framed. as a way to get rid of him. Framed for a crime he didn't commit and sent to prison with all the people that he had put in, in prison. And then he gets murdered in prison and becomes sort of a martyr to the community, kind of an inspirational figure. So that's a good way to salvage, uh, I think, a, a misstep that had taken place many years earlier. All right. Well, like I said, there there are huge numbers of, of black characters that uh, we could have a whole course probably on that. But uh, I'm going to stop with listing the characters now because we've covered the, the, the main ones, the important ones as far as the uh, superheroes especially. Uh, and we're going to change focus now and look at some of the African-American people on the other side, uh, which is to say the creative side, black writers and artists. <laughs> 